Praise the Lord, everyone. If we can stand here tonight, let's start tonight in prayer. We have uh, several people who are sick, and I don't know about you, but I believe in the power of healing. I believe that there is nothing that God cannot do. Praise God. He can do everything. Praise the name of Jesus. So I believe tonight that the Lord will touch, hallelujah, the uh, people who are sick. I believe that he will help us tonight. Hallelujah. So let's pray together. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Oh, we give you glory, Jesus. Oh, mighty God, you are so wonderful. You are powerful, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, and we give you glory, Jesus. Hallelujah. We lift up your name, Lord, because it is a name above all names, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your presence here tonight, Lord, for your presence in our lives, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the perfect sacrifice, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. Hallelujah. For each one of us and giving us a life more abundantly, mighty God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, tonight we just want to give you, Lord, a sacrifice of praise, Lord. Hallelujah. We know, Lord, that you are the only God. You are the only way to get to heaven, Jesus. Hallelujah. We are grateful, hallelujah, for everything that you are doing. Hallelujah. In our lives, Lord, in our city, mighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that your will is perfect, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, mighty God, and in your name, Lord Jesus, we will survive. Hallelujah. The attacks of the enemy, we will grow, mighty God, in you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we know that the, oh, that the battle belongs to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And in your name, Lord, hallelujah, just like your disciples, Lord, we are going to cast the net. Lord, hallelujah, and we will see, hallelujah, how you are going to continue, oh, to do great signs and miracles and wonders, Lord, in our lives, Lord, in our families, Lord Jesus. I pray tonight, Lord, for those who are sick in our church, Lord. I pray, Jesus, for your healing power to reach, hallelujah, every person, Lord, that is at the sound of my voice tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. We believe and we trust in your name, the power that only comes from you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I praise you and I magnify your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you are going to be doing tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Here in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. Oh, just for kids, Lord. Our young people in Anthem, Lord. Our young adults, mighty God. May your spirit fill this place tonight, Lord. May your power, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, destroy the works of the enemy. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Heal, Lord, every heart. Oh, work in our minds, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And may your word will flow with power, Lord. Hallelujah. And reach every heart, Lord. Oh, in the wonderful name of Jesus, Lord. Oh, we give you the glory, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated here tonight. Praise the name of Jesus. Just a few announcements about what's going to happen in the next few days. First Friday, it's Good Friday, and we will have our family prayer time like we always do. But right after prayer, after prayer we will have communion. So let's be ready and uh, let's fill this place. We always have great attendance in our uh, prayer services uh, because we know the importance of that service. And as we have seen, uh, we can testify that the service on Sunday morning, it is a direct reflection of what we experience in prayer ahead of time. Praise God. So this weekend is not going to be any different. Hallelujah. Saturday. We are going to be setting up the tents for Easter. We're going to start about 10 a.m. 
uh, point of contact, leading the Air Force, Brother James Hill. Uh, we need about 20 people to set up the tents very quickly. Uh, so if you have the time, 10 o'clock is not bad. It will give you time to go hunting, uh, to get some breakfast. It will give you time to do all kinds of things and be here at 10 o'clock. So not bad at all. It's a good deal. And, of course, Sunday morning is our Easter service, and there's going to be a lot of work going on um, in preparation for that. Actually, there has been a lot of work and a few more details to be done on Saturday and even Sunday morning. Therefore, we will not have Sunday school. We will be here at 10 a.m. Uh, for prayer. Uh, I believe that just about everyone that is here probably is going to be way before that, uh, but for those who are not involved in anything with Easter, uh, 10 o'clock for prayer and a great service at 1030. How many are believing that the Lord is going to bring, I don't know, how many believe that God, God is going to bring 30, 100, 500? Hallelujah. You never know. Praise God. We just have to do what the Lord expects each one of us to do. Praise God. And I believe that the Lord is going to do great things here on Sunday morning. Praise God. And I just want to put a, a big plug for our small groups. Uh, the church app and the Slack have details. We have started groups for the ladies with their book club. Uh, we have a group of fitness that is called the Golden Girls for 55 plus, And they're having all kinds of fun. We also have a group for arts and crafts that is called Ladies DIY. And a music theme small group. Uh, playing with tracks. So all those have already started. Or they're doing well. well. Uh, on the 23rd at 5 p.m., we're going to have biblical stewardship class at 5 p.m. on the 23rd. That is a Saturday. And it's going to be about what it takes to truly become God's and faithful steward. And we're going to be defining joy, generosity, and trust and we're also going to have some tools that will help you uh, track your finances and doing budgets and, and do what it takes to really be a good steward of your time and treasure. So I invite you for that. And the last thing is our discipleship course. Uh, we did it last year. And it was a great success. It's four modules. And the first one is on May the 15th. That is a Saturday from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. That's just a month away. And I'm going to read what Sister Crazy Bear posted in Slack. And she wrote that this is a specific training to establish believers in fundamental doctrinal principles of the Word of God. The course is meant to establish the building blocks of a spiritual life. It is presented in a classroom setting. And you will be provided with a handbook. So this is the first one out of four modules. And this is what they call the foundational elements. It's a great material. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be new in the church. You can take this course at any given time. So take advantage of it. It's great, great material. So that's the first one on May the 15th. Praise God. So if you have any questions about the discipleship course, please see Sister Crazy Bear. You can sign up for it in the church app and also in Slack under church announcements. Praise God. At this time, I want to ask Brother Bolin uh, if he can come. We're going to collect our offering tonight. Praise the name of Jesus. So if we can stand and let's pray for the offering that we're going to collect tonight. And I just want to remind you there are so many different ways of giving here at First Pentecostal. You can bring your offering to the plate. You can give online. You can do text to give. You can use the debit card machine. Whatever means is best for you, we just make it easy. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for the offering that we are collecting here tonight. Lord, this is collected for your kingdom to reach the souls of Onslow County. I pray, God, that you continue to bless your church, bless your people, mighty God, as we give unto you with a grateful heart, mighty God. I ask you, Lord, for a huge blessing, Lord, tonight. Hallelujah. We know, Lord, that there are so many different ways that we can give unto you, 
But we do it always with a cheerful heart, trusting in you, believing, Lord, hallelujah, what your word tells us, Lord, that you will open, hallelujah, the windows of heaven, and you will continue to bless us in a powerful way. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may bring your offering. Praise the name of the Lord. As pastor comes tonight, praise the name of Jesus. If you have any questions about the weekend services, if you have any questions about our small groups, uh, please see me. Let me know. Praise God. And we will make sure that you are well familiar with everything that is going on here at First Pentecostal. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's stand and lift our hands toward heaven. Let's just thank him for his goodness, for his mercy. Hallelujah. God, you are so merciful to us. We come to worship you tonight. Spirit and in truth, I've come to magnify you. I've come to glorify you, Jesus. Lord, I am nothing. You are everything. Hallelujah. I am nothing but you are everything, Lord Jesus. I worship your name, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I know that you do pray for me, but I'd ask that you'd especially pray for our service on Sunday. The, the word of the Lord would go forward and uh, hungry hearts would receive the word of God. Praise the Lord. I've been wondering what Jesus must have been felt, feeling or thinking to himself, knowing what he knows. He knew everything. Knowing that he was headed on a course of death, he was, and, and there were so many opportunities for him to make detours and not go to Jerusalem. He could have gone anywhere, but he knew what his purpose was and what his mission was. And uh, nothing was going to turn him to the left or to the right. And uh, I just, it's been on my mind today in my office thinking about the things that the Lord knew that the disciples, you know, he, he must have tried to keep things light, you know. He must have tried to uh, encouraged, he was encouraging others, he was healing others, he was ministering to others the whole way until Calvary, and then afterwards he did the same, but he himself was, going to, was facing something so uh, important and so dramatic in his own life, and uh, he couldn't share everything. And a lot of things that uh, he spoke to the disciples, they had to play it out. They had to let everything play out before they knew exactly what he was talking about. He had talked to them before about tear this temple down in three days, I'll raise it up again. They didn't know what that meant until it played out. But Jesus knew what it meant. It knew, he knew what he was going to have to go through. And uh, all around the world, people are focused on this week being the road to Calvary. The Bible says that Jesus died once for us. 
And I, I remember as a kid hearing in places like the Philippines, the Roman Catholic Church, they would have young men that their whole lives, they knew they were going to play the role one day as a crucified man. And they would be beaten and whipped, and they would literally be crucified on Good Friday. They will do that in the Philippines. They will crucify people. I don't know if they do just one person or if they do many people. I, I don't know. But Jesus did it once for us. Praise God. And he that was without sin became sin for us. Amen. And uh, I'm thankful for what Jesus knew, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't take the easy road. He stayed the course. You and I, we, we have a course to take as well, and we have to stay the course. Praise the Lord. I don't know if you, uh, anybody here, if you follow the royals over in England. And, and uh, you know, they, Queen Elizabeth, she's held it together for how many, 70 years plus she's been on the throne. And, but her kids are struggling, you know. And uh, what, what's going to happen after she's gone, I don't know what's going to happen. There's all these people that are, are going to be jockeying for the throne. And uh, so, uh, you know, it, somehow the Queen Elizabeth has escaped the way it used to be. You know, they used to just, you know, poison each other and uh, kill each other and I mean, they, they, you know, it was all for the crown. But, you know, in order to wear a crown, you have to be of royal blood. You have to be a part of the royal family. And uh, you had to be a descendant of the king, to inherit the throne one day. The Bible talks about you and I, one day we will gain a crown. But we don't necessarily on our own qualify anybody of royal blood here. I mean, I'm talking about your mom and dad, your, anybody from royalty. I don't have any royal blood in my, but you know what happens when we are born again, we get a, put in to the lineage of royalty because of the new birth. I was talking with a man the other day and he, he initiated, I, I was just, I was just sitting there. And uh, just minding my own business, he goes, are you a Christian? I said, yes. He said, are you born again? I said, yes. Amen. So I don't, I don't just deserve a crown because, of, because my name is Don David. But I qualify for a crown one day because I was born again. And as a born-again individual, I am now a part of the royal family. And, you know, you have to act a certain way when you are a royalty. You have to behave a certain way. The royal family over in England have found out that you can't just bring somebody in from outdoors and make them royalty because they don't understand what it takes to be a royalty. 
and they've got themselves in a big mess. But you and I today, we are of royal blood. The blood of Jesus is flowing through us tonight. We've been bought with a price. I'm thankful today that one day the Lord has promised that He is going to give me a crown. Now, I'm not going to wear that crown for long because the Bible says we're going to throw our crowns at His feet. But I'm going to get a crown one day. But the Bible also tells us that there will be no crowns without a cross. There will be no crown without a cross. You see, you and I, we, we were just paupers. We were just the commoners until Jesus came into our lives. And now we are the children of the King of kings and the creator of all things. If you study history, a lot of earthly kings have lost their crown. They have misused their authority. And they have eventually been replaced. The Bible says, Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You got to hold on to it, you got to value it. That crown doesn't come without a cost. There's got to be a cross in your life for you to inherit a crown. If you study the kings in the Bible, you'll find that there was probably more evil kings than there were good kings. They became kings because God made them a king. Remember Saul? Saul was just looking for some sheep. And God found him, made him a king. And uh, David, he was just tending his sheep. And God found him. Amen. And God gave them authority. But a lot of the kings misused that authority. He gave them wealth. Remember, he warned the children of Israel, now if I give you a king, he's going to take your lands, he's going to take your sons and your daughters and make them his servants. But a lot of the kings misused that wealth. He gave them wisdom, but they misused that wisdom. Solomon, the wisest man on earth, he misused the wisdom that God gave to him. And the end of him is not a happy story to read about. Praise God. There are kings that decided to follow God, or the God, I should say, of their own minds, and not the God that placed them upon the throne. There are those that sought their own fame and their own power. They thought they were doing it of their own ability. And so they listen to their own thoughts rather than listening to the God that spoke to them in visions and in dreams, spoke to them from the mouths of the prophets. There were kings in history and in the Bible days also that ceased from being godly kings and became worldly kings. There are also Christians today who begin godly, as godly Christians, but ended up being worldly because they ceased to follow the Creator that had given them the spirit of adoption and grafted them into His royal family. Amen. We are a royal priesthood. A holy nation, 
the Bible says. But there are people that have abused that and have misused what God has given to them. There are those that have decided that I can become my own priest and have fallen into destruction. Amen. If you study the scriptures, you'll find that God made sure that every king had a man of God that was speaking into their lives if they would listen to the voice of God. The ones that were successful, the ones that remained upon the throne, the ones that remained in the will of God were those who listened to the man of God or the voice of God speaking into their lives. But I want to tell you today that there will be no crown in our future if there is no cross in our present. Salvation is not free. It costs Jesus everything. Heaven was suffered a loss in order to purchase salvation for us today. The cross that our Savior bore upon His back was heavy and it was difficult to carry. If you can imagine with me today the journey that Jesus took to Golgotha, having his back ripped apart with a cat of nine tails, beaten beyond recognition, now having to carry the cross, his own cross, up that hill to Golgotha, ridiculed by Roman soldiers, ridiculed by religious people of that day, but Jesus never fought back. He never defended himself because he knew that this cross was a cross of utmost importance. If the world was going to be saved, he was going to have to stay the course that he was on. He couldn't look to the left or to the right. He had to stay the course. Sure, we want the crown, but we don't want the cross. But there will be no crown today if there is no cross. If we are going to be true followers of Jesus Christ, we have to be willing to die. We have to die out to sin. The cross for being holy, faithful, and loving, and giving is a heavy cross for some people. It's a cross of denying oneself and carrying the burden for someone else. In the book of Mark, chapter 8, and verse 34 through 38, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, let he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why does God use if so much when talking to us? For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If any man is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross. You've got to deny yourself. Luke chapter 14 and verse 27 from the NIV, 
It says, and everyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Cannot be my disciple. What did Jesus mean when he said, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me? What did Jesus mean? really mean let me first of all tell you what he did not mean many people interpret the cross as being some kind of burden that they must carry in their lives a strained relationship or a thankless job or a physical illness it's almost we carry that cross as a self-pity Pride, I'm doing this for Jesus. I'm carrying this cross for Jesus. That's my cross that I've got to carry. And such an interpretation, I believe, is not what Jesus meant when he said, take up your cross and follow me. When Jesus carried his cross up Golgotha to be crucified, nobody was thinking of the cross as a symbolic burden that he had to carry. To a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only. Death by the most painful, the most humiliating means humanly possible that could ever have been developed. And the Roman Empire, they perfected the humiliation of the cross. 2,000 years later, Christians are viewing the cross as a cherished symbol to wear, uh, to identify themselves as a follower of Jesus. That the cross is a symbol of atonement or forgiveness and grace and love. But back in Jesus' day, the cross represented nothing but torturous death to anybody who had to carry a cross. Because the Roman soldiers focused, uh, forced these convicted criminals to carry their own crosses to the place of crucifixion, bearing a cross meant carrying their own tool of execution, amen, and facing the ridicule and the humiliation of all those who were watching from a distance. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. It means being willing to die in order to follow Jesus. This is called dying to self. It's called absolute surrender. After each time that Jesus commanded us to bear our cross, he said, for whosoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loseth his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, the Bible says, and yet lose his soul? Luke chapter 9 and verse 24, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? The call is tough, but the reward is matchless. There is going to be a great reward for those who are willing to take up their cross. And follow Jesus. Some people can't live for Jesus because they can't handle the sacrifice of following Jesus. The Bible talks about that seed that falls on thorny ground where the thorns are grown up. It's, it smothers out and, and with the cares of this life and the things that are going on and people have are not going to make it because they can't handle, amen, what God is asking them to handle. 
There is a cross that you and I have to pick up for ourselves. If any man will take up his cross, the Bible says. Take up your cross. Amen. Our idea of what Jesus is all about is much different than what people of his day believed. Wherever Jesus went, he, grew, he drew a great crowd that followed him everywhere. The multitudes often followed Jesus and hailed him as their Messiah as long as he was healing their sick and raising their dead and doing miracles and signs and wonders. But as soon as he began to tell them that he was going to have to give his life in order for the kingdom of God to be restored, when he began to preach to them how that one day he would be turned over to the hands of the oppressive rule of the Roman occupiers, even the inner circle of Jesus began to diminish and many people stopped following him. He began teaching that he was going to die at the hands of the Jewish leaders and their Gentile overlords in Luke chapter 9 and 22. And when he began to talk like this, even his disciples uh, rebuked him. Uh, Peter said, no, it's not so. And Jesus looked at him and said, get thee behind me, Satan, because he knew what his course was about. But his popularity began to diminish when he began to talk about the road of suffering that he was going to have to go down. Many people were shocked about this. They had expected something different. They were expecting for him to set up his kingdom here on earth and to drive out the oppressive Roman government. But that wasn't the plan of God at all. They weren't able to reconcile their idea of why the Messiah came with their own ideas, what their own plans. What did the mother say? When you come into your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on your left hand and one sit on your right hand? They had their own idea of what Jesus meant about setting up the kingdom of God. But their ideas were not the ideas of Jesus Christ. He had something altogether different. That's our problem today. We want to pick how we serve Him, how we follow Him in our own convenience. Living for Jesus is supposed to be smooth sailing. It's supposed to be just a man, just a great ride from now until eternity. Amen. But our true commitment to Jesus is not found on the road, a man of ease, a road that is smooth, but our true commitment of Jesus uh, to Jesus is found, uh, amen, in the time of trial. It's revealed uh, to, in us, amen, whether or not we are going to follow Jesus, amen, or not. Hallelujah. Jesus assured us that trials were going to come to his followers in John chapter 16 and verse 33. Discipleship was going to demand Sacrifice. Jesus, he never hid the cost from his disciples. He wanted them to know exactly what they were getting into. 
He wanted them to know, amen, that what they were going to have to face. That's why he, in the face of death, amen, did not shirk his own duty, but he endured the shame, and he endured the suffering and the torture, and he took his way to the old rugged cross, amen, letting his disciples know that they might have to go the way that he went. Amen. I don't know how many have ever read the book of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Anybody ever read that book? You need to read that book. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Peter, he didn't understand this. He didn't understand this when he looked at Jesus and rebuked him. He didn't understand. It wasn't until after Calvary, until after Amen. He many years of ministry and, and establishing the church. Amen. When it was his time. And they were going to crucify him upon a cross. Uh, he said, no, I can't be crucified like my Savior. And so they inverted him and they crucified Peter upside down. Because there's going to be a sacrifice in following Jesus. It's going to cost you something. Hallelujah. I, I hear it all the time. Pastor, I, I, you know, we're just so tired. We work so hard. All week long, we just, we needed Sunday morning to catch up. <laughs> we needed some, uh, our time, we needed some of that. Jesus said, if you're not going to follow me, if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross. Because there will be no crown, no reward. Without a cross. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 57, it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me at first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And the other, another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but first let, let, first bid, go bid, uh, let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus relays the, story, the three individuals in this passage of Scripture who seemingly were willing to follow Jesus, but at their own time and with their own agenda in mind. And when Jesus questioned them further, their commitment to him, was after they got what they were going to do done, then they were going to do what he wanted done. Their commitment to Jesus Christ was half-hearted. Oh, I hope that I never be found half-hearted. Half-hearted. I don't want to be just a half-hearted Christian. I don't want to be a half-hearted follower of Jesus. I want to do it with my whole heart. They failed to count the cost of following Jesus. None were willing to take up his cross and crucify upon it their own interest and their own desires. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, Behold, one, man, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus said in the next scripture to keep the commandments. And he told Jesus, well, I've done that since my youth. Then Jesus said, sell all you got and follow me. And the man went away sorrowfully. The real question came, the question that everybody hates to hear because it's going to demand giving up something you love something that you love more than anything or anyone else. Uh, amen. Here's what kept him from the kingdom of God. In Matthew 19 and 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, 
and give it to the poor, for thou and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when the young man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions, and his unwillingness to sacrifice cost him eternal life. Amen. Listen in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. When we came to Jesus, we were ready to follow and do anything because we were so excited about being saved. We wanted everybody to feel what we were feeling when we came into the presence of the Lord. We wanted everybody to feel the, understand the, the experience of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and having our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. We wanted everybody. But when we began to count the cost, amen, all too often, amen, there are those that just keep falling by the wayside because the cost is too much for them. What happens to that excitement and that commitment that we first had when we followed Jesus? How many people, amen, would respond to an altar call that went, come follow Jesus. You may face the loss of family, family and friends and reputation and career and possibly even your life. Who's, who's going to answer that call? The number of converts, I think, would sadly decrease. Jesus gave that kind of call. He gave that kind of altar call. He said, take up your cross and follow me. If you wonder if you are ready to take up your cross, I want you to consider these questions today. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means you're going to lose some of your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing some of your family or alienating your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means a loss of your reputation? What are they going to think about you? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Amen. In some places in the world, these consequences are not just written in a book, but they are a reality to them. There are those that are having to make up their mind every day for their life or whether they're going to follow Jesus. Amen. There are people that I know that there are villages in Pakistan where the Muslim uh, in the neighboring area, and the Muslims can come into that village and they can raid that village at any time without any repercussions. They go in and they burn their houses down and they rape their women and they, they kill them and there is nothing done to them. And you and I, we have the liberty to come to the house of the Lord and yet there are many, even tonight, who had other things to do tonight. I believe that the church has faced a great testing through the co corona, the COVID season. Through the pandemic, I believe the church has been tried and many people They were in it just for the loaves and for the fish. They were in it just for the miracles and the signs and the wonders. But being presented with a new way of living, they took that. Now, living for Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that you will have to give up your life. You may not lose real friends. 
You may not be alienated from your family. I know that it has happened in the past. But the question here is not whether you will, but are you willing? Are you willing to take up your cross? If there comes a point in your life where you're faced with a choice, Jesus or the comforts of this life, which will you choose? So many people use that phrase, what would Jesus do? How many has ever heard that phrase before? What would Jesus do? <laughs> well, when it comes to Calvary and when it comes to the cross, if you ask the question, what would Jesus do? Jesus took his cross. He carried it up that hill. He gave his life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to ask ourselves every day, are we willing to take up our cross? Jesus said in Luke 22 and 42, Father, if thou, wilt, or thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not I, but thy will be done. What is the will of God for your life? What cross do you have to carry to wear a crown? Aren't we more concerned about what we are going to have to give up and not what we have to gain? Hallelujah. There is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. If you're not willing to take up your cross, you will miss heaven. Every time I ask the question, everybody wants to go to heaven, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven. But are we willing to deny ourselves, take up your cross and follow Jesus? Are you willing to separate yourself from the sin in our world? Are you willing to separate yourself from sinful people and sinful activities and sinful lifestyles and sinful agendas and follow Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is an invitation that has been given by the Lord for us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. I don't know what that is going to mean for you, I don't even know altogether what it's going to mean for me. That's why I've got to daily take up my cross. Amen. It's not just a one-time thing. We've got to daily take up our cross and follow Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I don't know what we are going to have to go through in this life to serve Jesus. But I know that the pandemic was just a prelude of what we are going to have to face. 
but I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. One day I do want to get a crown. One day I do want to receive the reward. I do. Bible says, but Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame. He didn't do that for himself. He didn't need saving. He didn't have any sins to forgive. He didn't need rescuing. He could have called 10,000 angels. Don't you know they would have come? But he didn't do that because he knew that that was his cross. What are we going to do the day when our cross presents itself? Are we going to pick it up? Are we going to follow Jesus? Are you willing to bear your cross for Jesus? Amen. Let's stand together today. I do believe I have royal blood flowing in me. I believe you have royal blood flowing in you because you've been born again of the water and the spirit. You've been engrafted into a royal family. Amen. There is a crown with your name on it. I've got a crown with my name on it. But I won't get my crown unless I'm willing to pick up my cross and follow Jesus. Amen. Right where you're standing, why don't you lift up your hearts to Jesus right now. Have a little conversation with him. Help me, Jesus. Help this not to just be words. Of my heart, I want to follow you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, tonight for taking up your cross, buying redemption for us, salvation for us through the blood of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Praise God. I'm thankful for your blood today, Jesus. I'm thankful, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help us. Help us, oh God, no matter the cost, to follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 I feel the presence of the Lord in here at this. Sanctuary tonight. Talk to Jesus as if you were standing right in front of him right now. Hallelujah.
Aleluya. Hallelujah. I've heard of people on their knees for miles on their knees crawling towards the place of crucifixion. Jesus is not asking that of us. He did that for us. He's asking for us to live for Him. He's asking for us to live for him, church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, cover us with your precious blood. Lord, one more time, I want to pray for every invitation that has been given out. Every card, every door hanger. Every personal invitation that's been given out, I pray, Lord, that it would fall into the hands of a hungry heart. You would draw people by your spirit. We're trusting you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have a small part in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We just have a handful of postcards left. Just a few days until Easter. Maybe now is the best time to, while it be fresh in their mind, to hand those out. So let's let's do all we can. And thank you ahead of time for all that you're going to be involved in this coming weekend. Amen. The Lord richly bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord tonight.